All right, so now we're going to talk about the for next statement, which is another type of repetition structure. Although it does function quite a bit like a do loop, but with special syntax, it makes it a lot easier for us to handle this very particular type of repetition. So let's take a look at it. Uh, we will be covering the uh, F5.7 section of the textbook. A counter controlled loop is very uh, similar to the pretest loop we saw before with int num, where we started it at one, we uh, made the loop run while it was less than or equal to five, or until it was greater than five, and we put the value of int num into that label. Um, that idea, and of course we, inc we incremented it by one, that idea of using a counter to control when a loop is going to run and when it's going to stop actually leads into this idea of the counter controlled loop, which is a pretest loop specifically with a looping condition controlled by a counter. Uh, so we know that the loop statements are run a very specific number of times, as opposed to like in a general do loop, which could have any boolean condition it could also have a um you know post that could be post test or pretest. it could have any condition it could be while or until anything like that um you have a lot more freedom with a do loop but a counter controlled loop specifically is controlled by that counter all right so we have this while loop this do loop that we have seen before and what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to convert this into a real counter control loop. I'm specifically going to convert it into a for next loop. For next is our counter controlled loop. So let's get into it. What we have right here is we've defined int num, uh, but I'm actually going to get rid of that. We don't need the equals one right here. I'm just going to define it right now. Now, um, instead of do while, I'm going to say for int num equals one to five. The next at the end here. And we don't need this step value either. What I'm left with is what should give the equivalent result. What I'm saying is for int num equals one to five label nums dot text and equals int num dot to string and the string containing space all that stuff but this for statement right here when i first enter the for statement it sets int num equal to one and then it runs through the body which right now just has the one statement so then it comes down and hits next it goes back up and it says okay now i'm going to increase it by one and check if it's greater than five, which it's not. So then it runs it for int num is equal to two, finishes, it goes to next, goes back up to the four, increases it by one. So now it will run everything for int num equals three and so on and so forth. All of that happens automatically. It does all of that increasing by itself. You don't need to actually put int num plus equals one or anything like that. It just handles it by itself. We can see that when I run it. And it displays and it works just fine. So this for loop is the equivalent of the while loop that I had before. Um, and you know, some a fun experiment we can actually do is we can see what happens if I left the um oh oops int num plus equals one. If I left this uh, increment in here, which was necessary for the while loop, but for the for loop, see the for loop increases int num by one already, but then we're increasing int num by one again. So it starts out at one comes down here, it becomes two, goes back up to the top, and inside of this four statement area, it becomes three because it's been increased by one. So you don't want to actually 
mess with your counter here because the for loop actually handles the counter itself, which is really nice. It, it's nice that it handles this um, automatic initialization of, not initialization, excuse me, the, the automatic incrementing of our counter. We don't actually need to worry about that. We can just worry about the stuff that depends on the actual counter inside the loop. So that's really helpful. Now, also for a fun experiment, I want to see what happens if we um, add the final value of int num into our label, just to see how it goes. Might be fun. And you see that there's a six at the end. So the way that the for loop knows how to stop is it will increment int num from, in this case, five to six, and then we'll say, okay, well, six is greater than five, so I need to exit the loop. It's actually checking every single value of int num and seeing if it's less than five and while, sorry, less than or equal to five. And while it's less than or equal to five, it's continuing. But as soon as it's no longer less than or equal to five, as soon as it's greater than five, then it stops and it exits the loop and it comes down to this uh, label nums part that I have put at the very end. But I put that there just to look at the last value of int num dot two string. In fact, I can actually really make that clear by saying last and that so we can start the program over again. And we can see the last value of six right there. So here's something neat that we can do. And I'm just going to comment out this uh, last value display uh, code really quick. Um, here's the cool thing we can do. We don't even need to initialize the counter ahead of time if we're only using the counter within the for loop. Because what I can do, I'm just going to comment this out as well. So we're not initializing it anymore. And I can put int num as integer like this. And the for loop is kind enough to actually create int num for us to use as a counter within the for loop. Isn't that fantastic? It's so lovely. So if we run this, and we try to display everything, it works perfectly fine. So you don't actually need to declare your counters before, like at the beginning of the procedure if you're just using it in the for loop. Now, let's say, you know, I want to take a, another look at that last value really quick. Um, well, there's builders when I do that. Hang on. No, I, I don't want to continue. What's going on? Int num is not declared. It may be inaccessible due to its protection level. Well, I'm using int num out here, but it was declared in the for loop. So if it's declared in the for loop, I can't use it outside of the for loop. Well, the reason why I can't use it outside of the for loop, I can only use it inside of the for loop, is because um, when you declare your counter inside of the for loop, inside of the for next statement like this, it has what's known as block scope. We talked about scope before with like local scope, or sorry, with a procedure scope, with class scope, all that kind of stuff. Block scope is a little bit funny because it applies to variables that are technically declared within a certain block. So when I write out a for loop like this, what happens is it's as if I have put an imaginary dim int num as integer inside of the for loop rather than outside like this. So we can pretend that I've declared it inside of the for loop. Now, when something is declared inside of the for loop like this, it's actually not accessible once the for loop ends, sort of like how when you declare a, a, a variable inside of a uh, procedure, it's not accessible after that procedure ends. Um, unless it's a static variable, but you know, we're not worrying about static variables right now. No, a, um, it, it's a similar idea where 
the block scope means that int num is only accessible inside of here. As soon as this next thing happens, as soon as our indentation pops back out and we're in the rest of the procedure after the for loop, int num has been completely destroyed and it's un it's unusable. So that's why we get this error. So if you want to use your counter outside of the for loop, you have to declare it before the for loop. However, if you want to use your counter uh, only inside of the for loop and it doesn't need to be used any anywhere else, and that will probably be the case for most of your for loops, you can declare it inside of the for loop like this and it works totally fine. So that's what blocks scope is. All right, so what I've done is I have redeclared int num before the for loop specifically because I want to have this last line of code right there where I can actually see the value of int num that made the for loop decide to exit. Uh, in this case, because six is greater than five, it decides to exit like that. Um, and perhaps it will be easy to understand why I want to include this as I go through demonstrating the next idea. So the next thing I'm going to do, it's another feature of for loops that are really, really cool, right? Um, and you, you can, of course, implement this in your while loops as well. You know, your do loops, I should say. But for the for loops, uh, they make it real easy. So I'm going to type step one. And we'll take a look at it. Nothing really changes, does it? It's exactly the same. Step one. What, is, what does that mean? Um, well, let me try this. Step two instead. Now the list has changed. One, three, five, and then the last number was seven. Wasn't that fun? What step does is it determines how much we increase int num every iteration of our for loop. And iteration, by the way, is every time we run the statement block. So when we iterate through the for loop, we run all of these statements between four and next. But every iteration, when I have step two right here, int num gets increased by two instead of one. So instead of going from one to two, it goes from one to three. Well, let's try step three. See how that works. That's another interesting one. We go from one to four and then to seven. See this last value right here is funny because we're completely skipping five, right? But what the for loop is checking, it's not checking to see, okay, have we already hit five and then processed everything? It's not checking for that at all. It's checking to see if the current value of int num is greater than five in this case. So one is less than or equal to five. Four is less than or equal to five. Both of those are fine. 7 is greater than 5. So 7 we can't do. Um, it will leave the for loop and then that's where I capture that 7 and say, hey, what's the last value, right? But inside of the for loop, this 1 and 4 are the only things that get run. And then when it sees 7, it completely stops. So it doesn't ever have to hit 5. 5 is just the uh, the greatest value that I am okay with and anything greater than that the loop needs to stop. All right, let's try another cool one. Uh negative 1. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see how that goes. We'll run it. We'll display it and it just exits immediately. It doesn't even try. Isn't that interesting? It sets um int num to one because remember the default value is zero so we know it's set int num to one and then it's looking at the step and seeing that it's going in the wrong direction 
So then it just exits completely and takes a look at this, um, you know, it just pops it over to this label nums.txt line right here. So if we put a negative step, well, it doesn't work. Well, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's see if this goes anywhere. I'm going to start int num at five and step negative one until it hits one. It's going in the right direction at least, right? In this case, maybe it's stepping by five. It's going, it's making a decrease or something. You know, let's see. Ah, it does work. So now in this case, it starts at five and it goes down until it sees a number that is less than one. Uh, we can try step negative, negative three, let's say. That should be interesting. Yeah, see, it doesn't even have to hit the number one as long as it sees a number that is less than one. Then it will stop completely. So you can have negative values for step in order to decrease uh, your counter instead of increasing your counter. So that's really helpful, isn't it? I mean, you get to really easily choose how much your counter is increased or decreased by, and they also have tools to make it so that you can't step in the wrong direction. If I tried to step positive three right here, It just exits out of the loop completely and sets int num equal to 5. So that's really helpful. Now I should point out as well, just to be sure, that I can... Um, I can set, you know, initialize int num as integer inside of the for loop and still make it work with step. So I'll just do step negative one for now, but it, it'll be the same for anything. But I want to really make sure that it's, you know, that's known to be an option. You don't have to do this, like declaring it before and then what doing whatever after it. Uh, I'm just doing that to check the last value of the integer so we can say, ooh, isn't that cool that it ends there? But uh, yeah, that's just a quick aside. All right, so now I have made a quick change. I'm starting int num at negative one and going to one rather than starting it at uh, one and going to five. So different starting values. Um, and as you can see, we have negative one, zero, one, and then the last value is two, kind of what we would expect. Um, uh, that's not very many values in there though. I kind of want to see a little bit more. So let's take a look at some half steps at 0 0.5 and see how that goes. Builders, huh? No. Um, oh, see, that's a, this is a whole thing. Uh, we're, we're saying that you should be using option strict on, which is really helpful because in this case, um, we have int num, which is an integer and we're trying to compare it to, uh, or sorry, we're trying to like do stuff with it using a double value, but the result has to be an integer because this holds an integer right here. Int num must be an integer. So if we try to work with uh, this 0 0.5 step right here, we would be converting it from a double back into an integer and we'd be losing data. Negative one plus 0 0.5 would be negative 0 0.5 but then we'd try to chop off the uh, decimal point send that back down to negative one which would be unfortunate because then we'd get a, an infinite loop or even if we started at zero and we tried to add 0 0.5 and then we chop off the decimal point as part of the conversion to back to integer that would just go back down to zero so we can't mix integers and doubles in this way instead what we have to do Double, double, uh, double. We have to convert everything to a double. No integers allowed right here. 
And that's what's going to allow us to use uh, step 0 0.5. I'm going to put in, uh, say, n1, just to be sure. There we go. So now we have negative 1, negative 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5, 1. What we might expect, the last value is 1.5, which is larger than 1, so the loop ends. And then we capture that in our last value kind of thing. So pretty cool. And of course, um, I can actually do negative steps with our double based counter as well. So if I change it from 1 to negative 1 with a step of negative 0 0.5, uh, it works exactly the same way. So uh, the data type in this case does not matter. All right, so there are two ways you can handle flowcharts for for next. Um, the first one is pretty much exactly the same way you would handle a do loop flowchart for a loop that uses a counter, sort of like what we've seen before. So um, in this case, we have our until uh, pretest loop, uh, the, the pretest loop with the loop exit condition where, you know, we declare the variable ahead of time. We check if it's greater than five. If that's false, we run through the loop and then we add whatever our step value is to int num. And then we pop back up to before the condition and repeat that over again. So you can, if you want, when you're flowcharting everything, just use a, um, a regular do loop flowchart and then you can decide in implementation whether or not you want to do that as a for next or as a do loop. And the really nice thing about this too is that when you have this declare the counter variable and initialize it to one, you get to decide whether or not you want to include that inside of your for loop statement. So for int num as integer, right? You get to decide that. Um, you know, maybe you make the flowchart and then you look through the flowchart and you say, oh, well, int num is only being used within the for loop. So when I implement it, I will do the flow, the uh, for loop with my variable declared inside of that for loop rather than declaring it before the for loop. But what's also nice is that if you are using int num after the for loop as well as inside of the for loop and you see it pop up under this true path here in this case, it could, you know, and you can use the looping condition flowchart for your for next as well. You don't need to use loop exit, but that's an aside there. But if you see int num during the um, path that exits the loop, you know, anytime after you've exited the loop, you see int num then you can just leave it as is and you don't need to worry about it. Whereas with example two here, you know, example two is really nice because we're saying, okay, our counter is int num, our initial value is one, our step is one. That's what the middle value is right here. Left value is initial, middle value is step, and then the right value is the exit condition. So in this case, it's greater than five. Uh, and then, you know, that's really nice because you don't have to worry about initializing it ahead of time. You don't need to worry about uh, calculating the step value inside of the loop or anything like that. You can just handle it all in there. However, if you, um, if you realize, oh, well, I actually need to use int num after the for loop, then this example two doesn't quite work so much because you kind of have to actually do an it a uh, int num declaration ahead of time so you're actually changing things in the flowchart as you're realizing as you're realizing all of this um and, you know you run the risk of it at least so what you could really do as well is just stick between start and int num just a quick declare int num and initialize it to something or even just declare int num and then just let it run straight into this for loop and that would probably represent, you know, 
okay, we have a pre-declared int num and we're setting it equal to one at first and all that kind of stuff, but yeah. Well, okay, let me uh, really quick actually specify this, um, you know, in this example to flowchart right here, the hexagon specifically is what represents a for loop with the false coming out the left and the true coming out the right. Um, our condition greater than five is representative of the fact that we are going upwards. We have a positive step. If we started at five and ended at one with a negative step, we would have our exit condition being less than one. So that depends on what values make you stop the um, for next loop. And you can even treat this uh, condition here as a looping condition as well, where you said less than or equal to five, and then the left branch was true and the right branch was false or something like that. You have freedom here, but those are just some examples of how you can handle the flowcharts. All right, so that is our introduction to the for next statement, the other um, repetition structure that we will be talking about in this chapter. It's a very cool and powerful one, so I hope it is very useful for you.